France Céline. I had a letter from the college to say that my academic standard was fine, but would I nonetheless come for interview to ensure that I was acceptable in speech, manners and writing? I sent a rather rude reply. It was one Christmas with my two little boys and we came down to London to stay with their parents for Christmas and it was snowing, so I booked first class tickets. I mean, I've just finished work, so I had a pair of jeans on and there were these two businessmen in the first class cabbage who were so snobby. And one of them went and got the guard to come and check our tickets as if we were entitled to sit in a first class carriage. I didn't say anything. I wanted to, but I didn't. Class still hurts. Bowler hats and debutantes are long gone, but it's never far away. We know it, we feel it, we laugh at it on reality TV shows. Think about your own family's class journey and what became of your school friends. I come from a family of writers and academics. We had every advantage and it was dinned into us how lucky we were compared with some children I played with. But what if I hadn't grown up surrounded by books and parents who talked to me? How do I know I'd ever have made it into journalism? We like to think that anyone could make it, but can they? This summer's riots have intensified the focus on the question of social mobility. In this series, I'm going to explore the extent to which class ceilings still block people's chances in life. We'll seek out the moments from babyhood through school and beyond when, for some, magic doors do swing open. I think that class consciousness is, in a way, declined at a time when inequality has increased, which is a re very remarkable thing. And the ability to hardwire inequality through things you can do for your children has very greatly increased. I went to meet Peter York, market researcher and style guru, in a chic London private members club, brimming with cool young men in expensive suits and no ties. It's now called Home House, pronounced as it's spelt, but it was once the palatial residence of the aristocratic Hume family, not pronounced as it's spelt, one of those upper-class traps for the unwary. People's knowledge of the hierarchy has changed because the hierarchy isn't local. It isn't the local plutocrat with the big factory and the big cigar. And it isn't the local toff either. There's a long-standing and very... British idea of class distinctions as a matter of a whole set of manners and aesthetics. But many, many of those things have completely lost their meaning. That's not what it's about in any proper analysis. It's about wealth and power. One reason we feel less class bound despite what's happened to wealth and power is our recent history. In the post-war years, the manual working class, which used to be the majority, shrank back from two-thirds of the population to just one-third. And at the same time, the middle class doubled in numbers, with a great upward surge in white-collar jobs. Many people have stories of how their families broke through the class ceiling. My grandmother was a lorry driver, my grandma was a cleaner, and they were aspirational. They wanted more for the next generation. My father was a chartered surveyor and his family did not have much money. It was the only profession in which he could be articled and earned from very early on. If you take my five children, they only went to normal primary schools and secondary schools. My mum was a, a telephone operator, my dad was a telephone engineer, so they were kind of at every stage making progress. Now, one of my sons went to Oxford University and is now a deputy headmaster. I'm a kind of classic product of the 20th century. My grandparents all left school at 14. My parents had really good secondary education but couldn't go on to university. And in my generation, we're all graduates. The problem is we expected the middle class to keep expanding forever. Then, about 10 years ago, studies started to emerge suggesting that social mobility had ground to a halt. Two thirds of us now never rise or fall much beyond what our parents earned. The Conservative MP David Willits, now the Coalition's Universities Minister, has thought long and hard about all this. He too sees a more class-bound country. If you look at the research that was done a few years ago, 
uh, access to the professions. It looks as if people who go into the leading professions now, you know, the, the lawyers, the, the civil servants, the journalists even, are more likely to come from affluent family backgrounds than before. And we do know from those two famous studies comparing people born in 1958 and people born in 1970, that it looks as if the people born in 1970, if you're born to a low-income family in 1970, you are less likely to end up enjoying a high income yourself than people born in 1958. I think since then, it's, it's probably been broadly flat, but sadly, we've not seen the improvement that we were all hoping for, and nobody really envisaged that in the modern world you might have less mobility than a generation back. Class and money aren't always identical, but there's no disguising what's happened to incomes, as the economist Andrew Dillnott explains. There are two big stories over the last 50 or 60 years. The first, and I think the most important, is that we're much better off. Real incomes per head in this country are now four times as high on average as they were in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War. We can buy much, much more of things that aren't necessity. So in the immediate aftermath of the Second War, we spend almost a third of all of our spending on food. The relative bad news story that people are aware of, though, is that the gap between those at the top and those at the bottom has grown. So the incomes of those at the top of the income distribution, the most well off, have grown significantly more quickly than those of the people in the middle of the income distribution, and even more so compared to those at the very bottom. Even in the boom years from 2003 to 2008, while Britain as a whole grew 11% richer, the lower half of earners in this country saw their pay flatline. And falling behind is a shock when people had got used to doing better than their parents. The pollster Deborah Mattinson now finds those who call themselves working class feel very much less mobile. Nowadays, as one respondent in a focus group put it to me, we call ourselves working class, but in some ways we're simply poor. That's all it is. A lot of them, particularly the older ones, will look back to a kind of golden age of being working class where you worked hard, you did a job, you lived in a close-knit community, you had trade unions that protected you, you had a political party that understood you, and life was relatively sweet. And they would say that has all changed and that the working classes are now under threat from immigrant workers who are undercutting their wages, they don't have jobs that are protected anymore, they don't have political parties that understand them. And what a lot of them said to us was, you know, there are now four classes. There's the fourth class, lower class, underclass. And a lot of them spent a lot of time explaining why they were not part of that class. So class may be mostly economic. But to understand how people do or don't stay where they're born, we need to take a closer look at each of the crucial stages in our lives. Let's start right at the beginning. When I found out that I was pregnant, to try and give Thomas the best start, really. I stopped drinking. Yeah, I didn't drink at all when I was pregnant. And I would take multivitamins. Catherine and her husband, John, are a middle-class couple living in Hertfordshire. When we spoke to them, their second child, Thomas, was eight weeks old. They also have a two-year-old girl, Hannah. When you look around, you can see how some parents hardly talk to their babies, while others manically stimulate them from day one. I remember trying flashcards on the first of my children, she cried and I stopped. Like many middle-class couples, Catherine and John have a clear sense of their children's future. We try and do the best we can in terms of education for the children, even when they're young. I mean, obviously, Thomas at the moment's a bit young, but they still do baby yoga classes and um, rhyme time at the library and things like that. And, you know, we try and get toys that are stimulating for them try and do that as you know from as early age as we can really our yeah. hopes for thomas are well that he does really what he wants to do if he would choose to go to university we'd definitely encourage he him solid education to give him that platform to go to university or, or medical school or whatever it is that he wants to do eventually um, provide him with everything that we can to open all those doors i guess by the time children start school at age five, there are clear socioeconomic gaps in their levels of achievement, clear gaps in their levels of school readiness. And on that, there seems to be little ambiguity. And that's evidence from the UK, but also from other countries. As Dr Anna Vignoles from the Institute of Education points out, the stakes are high. Family background comes through very early. 
the earliest point that you measure a child, even at 22 months, you can see these differences in their levels of achievement. And it varies hugely by socioeconomic background. So yes, these differences between uh, children who have advantaged and less advantaged family environments emerge very, very early. The latest research shows how much can go right or wrong well before school. The gap between the verbal skills of rich and poor children widens by 50% between their third and fifth birthdays. But sociologist Peter Saunders thinks innate ability is underestimated. If you take two children from identical social backgrounds, the discriminator is how they do on an IQ test at age 11. And it's a much, much stronger discriminator than any other single variable. It comes out as about three times more powerful as a predictor of where people end up than the social class variables, that what their parents did for a living, the income of their parents, whatever. Those things are still important. But the ability was the single biggest factor by a long way. And the second biggest factor was motivation. When you look at other countries, they don't have as large a gap between rich and poor children in terms of their achievement. And that would suggest that there are things we can do to change the environment that would reduce the socioeconomic gap. Anna Vignoles. Over the last 20 years, as research techniques have improved, brain science has been producing burgeoning evidence that a baby's environment has a permanent effect on their growing brain. Learning in infancy really is about the brain growing lots and lots of connections. Professor Usha Goswami, an education neuroscientist at the University of Cambridge. So the brain is effectively a learning system and it will develop connections to reflect all the learning experiences that the environment is producing for it. So you get massive connectivity between different regions in the brain developing in the period from sort of zero to five. What kind of experiments were conducted to show how important those first months are? We can use brain imaging to look at the amount of activity in the brain in certain situations. So, for example, if you're trying to track language development, you can take pre-verbal infants and show them, say, pictures of items that they should know the names of, like shoe or teddy. And then you can show them pictures where you give the wrong label. So you might show a picture of a shoe and say teddy. And the child is too young to tell you whether they know that's wrong or not. But you can see from the brain response that children do know it's wrong even before they can speak. I live in Hastings, which is a very socially mixed area. I was in a supermarket the other day. There's a woman going around with her youngster who's playing up and absolute shock went through everybody in the supermarket. She just clenched fist, clump around the side of the head. And this, this kid's three or four years old. I mean, immediately I start thinking about all the research I've done over the last 20 years where I'm saying, well, of course, if you're bright and now hard work and you can make it, you think, look at that kid, you think crumbs, you know, that's a terrible hurdle to have to jump when you start out from a, a home like that. Parenting, I think, is hugely important. I don't think the quality of parenting necessarily varies that strongly with social class. And you do get very good quality parents in lower class backgrounds and very poor quality parents in higher class backgrounds. But I think the quality of parenting is enormously important. God knows what happens to the hard wiring of that child's brain with a clump around the ear like that. A lot of people agree that the early years really matters. But what can you really do about it? Here I am in Blackbird Lees in Oxford, in the middle of a housing estate, where there are just a couple of porter cabins. And yet something really remarkable is happening here. It's called the Peak Project. So we're here for a visit in the shadow of a big secondary school, and curiously enough, it was the secondary school that said, by well, the time children come here, it's often too late. What we really need is to sponsor a programme for the earliest years, for the earliest months of babies' lives. Well, I was living in homeless accommodation and really on my own as well. Inside, I met Sue. PEEP is a model for the Sure Start programme. And she told me how it helped her do the best for her children. I've got three children and it made me think about each of my children as an individual. You just don't class them all as one. And it's recognising what they bring and what their personalities are. And I think that's what people draw out really. And did you do different things with your children as a result? Yeah, the main one that really stands out in my head is reading. When I saw the peak practitioner reading books with the babies, I just thought, 
I've not seen this before. It's not something I would have done. It was sort of like quite alienated for me. So seeing the older babies respond to the books as well, it was wonderful to see. And it's something I would, probably wouldn't have done until my children were a lot older. Do you come across mothers who don't realise they should be talking, singing, reading, interacting with babies because they think babies aren't responding, uh, at least until they're much older? Sometimes it's that, and also because they feel very silly doing it. They don't always recognise the first responses they're going to get. How are your children doing now? Well, they're very confident readers. They're very confident in their personality. They can cue into how their friends are feeling. I've had that come back on their school reports. Have you had much of a chance to share your book from your baby pattern? Yeah, we do occasionally. We sit there and have a look at it together. Sue now works for Peep, helping other mothers, like Tammy, who has a six-year-old daughter and now a baby son, who she brought to the centre. Books and pieces, but the black and white books that Peep have given me, he really enjoys looking at them. How's your six-year-old daughter getting on? If she hasn't got books from school, then she's got stacks of books at home, which she really enjoys reading. And um, we do that every night. Every night she has a book. Do you get a chance to share books together? Being at school was hard. I think that, that was the main thing. It was hard and I struggled with the work. And so now I don't want the same thing to happen for my daughter. And I'll be more encouraged to do books and stuff where I didn't have that at home so much with the reading. So I think having that now, it will give her a good, well, good chance in life, I hope. Trying to catch children early started in earnest with the last Labour government's Nursery and Sure Start programme. The jury's out on its impact until those children grow up. Under pressure from cuts, some of the 3,000s setting clear boundaries through ways of thinking, talking and dressing. Names, for instance. If one baby's called Anastasia and the other Wayneta, would you expect the same from them? Sociologist Peter Saunders remembers how his father's name filled him with class shame. My father's name, he was christened Albert. He was the oldest son and his father was Albert before him. And my dad was always mortified at being called Albert. He always felt that was a working class signifier. And even at the age of seven, I'd pick that up. So in front of the class, when I was asked, what's your father's name? I said, I can't remember, but I know his middle name is Edward. Names still signify yes, in, class. Oh, yes, indeed. Yes, yes. What are um, your children called? Michael and Claire, which I like to think is fairly classless. Although when Claire got to school, we found there were about five others. But Claire herself now has children who are Thomas and Mia. Uh, which I think are unmistakably middle class. So, if it's hard to stop children's first years doing so much to cement their destiny, can education transform their chances in life? Ambitious parents certainly think so when you listen to the stress they feel about getting their children into a good school. But Lee Elliott Major, Director of Research at the Sutton Trust, worries that all too often school days actually reinforce class. What we've seen happen in this country is that you have these huge inequalities in life and then people use those to exploit the education system for their own good. And then we find that those with better educational qualifications then get paid more by the society. So that educational inequality and income inequality feed off each other. Poverty itself is discouraging, with children feeling left out of ordinary society. The child who never goes away struggles to write that My Summer Holiday story and may feel school is not for them. 77% of English middle class pupils get the crucial five good GCSEs, but only 32% of working class pupils clear that hurdle. When I was at school there was a boy who was from quite a you know quite a poor background and when we were all given books to read at school and we were allowed to take them home and you know encouraged to read them he wasn't ever allowed to take them home because when he did the dog chewed them or his other brothers and sisters lost them or broke them or whatever and because of his background he wasn't then encouraged to be able to read in the same way as we were you know he wasn't given the same chances you could tell as time went on, certainly from about year eight onwards, that kids just started dropping out. They just stopped coming to school. If that sounds hopeless, politicians are unflagging in their promises to kick-start social mobility, to give such children hope. Gavin Kelly was an education advisor under Labour. David Willits sits on the Coalition Cabinet's social mobility group. We do know already from the children born in 2000 that already the children with high ability from low-income families, it looked as if, sadly, they were falling behind.
behind. So there is some some evidence we need to come in, but it's a challenge to all of us to, to do better and also not to write them off because even if in their early years they were falling behind, it doesn't follow that their sort of fate is now determined. That's why one of the crucial features of our strategy is to carry on intervening at every stage. And as you know, the latest paper that's come out just in the last few months does show that the underlying abilities of these children are not being destroyed, but they, they've got the potential. We've just got to make sure that we enable them to the, make the most of the potential that they've got. Well, the one thing which we really pushed through and we were very excited about was a programme called Every Child a Reader, which is a, an initiative which took the most difficult to teach young children, it's typically six and seven year olds, the kid that kind of the one kid in the classroom that would always be left behind and would, would not be able to progress, that a lot of teachers, frankly, would give up hope for in some way. And it focused exclusively on those kids in terms of their reading capacity. And it had breathtaking results. It showed that you could teach them intensively through one-to-one -one support. And not only would they catch up with the average of the rest of the class, which they did, but most strikingly of all, they would sustain that improvement over a period of years. And the rest of the class also saw a higher level of improvement. Has that scheme been kept going? No. That scheme has had the vast majority of its money withdrawn. Take pupil premium, and that's mostly money from existing programmes to help poorer children redistributed in ways that it's no longer ring fenced. Head teachers can spend it on what they like. Is this really going to make a difference to their prospects? Well, it does mean that if a, a kid turns up at school from a low income background, there'll be more resource on his or her head for teaching them than for kids from more affluent backgrounds. And that's a really vivid piece of evidence of the coalition's commitment to help kids from poor backgrounds. We're a comprehensive college, which means that we've got the whole range of courses from here and beauty right through to science and uh, uh, philosophy. Um, but also comprehensive in the but sense getting a leg up in life is about so much more than good um, grades. You can't miss that winning confidence and social ease some children get from their families without even noticing, but others don't. Ken Warman, the head teacher of B6, a sixth form college in Hackney in East London, has made tackling this his mission. For success at university. So we make a very big effort to develop the all round personality and skills and attributes of our students. Tell me a bit about this building. As you see, the facilities are uh, very modern, but we've also made a big effort to have the educational mission of the college portrayed in every way. So you'll see that there are pictures of successful students, that the slogans aspire, study, achieve, high standards for all are everywhere. I used to be extremely shy when I came here. You know, I wouldn't talk loudly, even if it was a class full of all my friends, still wouldn't talk loudly. The college so gets students like Hital to make public presentations to the governors. So as soon as I got there, you get this adrenaline rush and it just makes you feel like this is what you're meant to do. It actually made me feel so confident and I just wasn't as shy as I normally am. Faith, meanwhile, found herself being trained at an equal level with teachers to observe lessons. I think during that moment it was, yeah, I'm, I'm a very confident person and I'm a mature person because I'm sitting here full of a room with teachers and it allowed me to think I can do what I want to do with anyone because I'm the youngest, I was only 16 at the time and I've got a teacher who's 47 sitting next to me doing the same thing. Here, our deliberate intention is to give our students a public school experience, in a way. And people are quite shocked at the people who come and speak here. Our students always say, why do they come here, sir? And I say, because we ask. And I think we are attempting to give people what public schools give their students. So all kinds of schools can give their pupils confidence. But moving up a social class can be painful. Tory MP David Davis felt liberated by his South London grammar school in the 1960s, but writer Lindsay Hanley, climbing the ladder to university and metropolitan success from her Birmingham comprehensive, found it emotionally difficult. Where I grew up and the time I grew up particularly, it just wasn't a word that was used, university. And I had this kind of private ambition from the age of probably about six or seven to go and I can't tell you where I got it from to be honest. I think I just had a notion of university being kind of like a great big library. And how was it that you made it? Well 
In, in my case, principally, I think, because of the grammar school. The area was a pretty working class area, it covered a very mixed class of uh, people, but it got people into Oxford and Cambridge and into uh, many other success streams. So it was an interestingly achievement-oriented environment and it encouraged that in me, I guess. I had a really, really hard time at secondary school in particular. And so I became very, very withdrawn, very, uh, well, you know, depressed a lot of the time, extremely nerdy and just, just couldn't fit in if I tried, really. And so I think I just channeled absolutely everything into the desire to get away, really, and into the desire to sort of escape into this giant library. <laughs> The end of grammar school took a year out to earn my money to go to university and then to Warwick and London Business School and Harvard later. Within a term or so of starting sixth form, I'd gone from feeling as though I'd made it out into this place that I'd longed to get to, to feeling absolutely alienated, cut off, had something resembling a breakdown basically. And I think it was almost entirely to do with culture shock. I don't think I had until that point realised that class existed in the form it does. And coming from a school that felt like it was in Soviet Russia, basically, to go to this college, which really was kind of like almost like a sort of mini university, really, in terms of how big and how well resourced it was. And people just completely took it for granted. And that really, really, really shocked me. Throughout my entire life, I've always felt lucky. I've always had more money than I needed most of the time. And I've always felt that I've had a decent chance, I've been successful. So there's no point in my life where I can say that I have been particularly conscious of social class. I've always felt working class from the beginning. I've never challenged that assumption. And of course, it's had odds with the facts. A 35-year-old woman having her first baby lives in London and wears Birkenstocks, you know, I'm about as middle class as she can get. So for some, at least, schools are a ladder up. If you could make it to university, you'll earn an extra £100,000 over a lifetime. And that's only an average. Top graduates earn far more. I have two A-levels and I applied for three universities last year and I could not get into one of them. When I took A-levels back in the mid-1960s, only one in ten of us got the chance to go to university. By 1980, two and a half times as many students to get higher education. Now it's nearly one in two. Wave upon wave of gleaming plate glass towers of learning opened up everywhere. They were built by both parties over the years, determined to let in all those bright kids from council estates who'd never had the chance. But did it work? Not necessarily. Professor Alison Wolfe, an expert on universities, and David Willits, the university's minister. What seems to have happened was that when we had the big expansion of universities, the prime beneficiaries were the daughters of more affluent parents. Now, this is not a bad thing. I'm not against women having opportunities of going into education and employment. That's a fantastic thing. A large number of middle-class girls go who didn't go before. A considerable number of middle-class boys who didn't go before go. And a not insignificant number of boys and girls from less affluent families go. But the big increase has been that Essentially, if you're middle class, you go to university. And everybody would have hoped that the, that expansion of higher education transformed opportunities for kids from poorer backgrounds. It didn't appear to have done so, but it does remind us of the challenge. One of the reasons why we've got depressingly low levels of social mobility in Britain is that even well-intentioned policy initiatives haven't always had the effects that were expected from them. Downward mobility isn't allowed now. As Peter York says, knowing parents push hard for the best. People actually make sure that their children prosper. And so people who, who would I would have graduated as sort of buffers now tell me, well, my daughter, meaning the girl who in another generation will have learnt to arrange flowers or gone on a history of art course, my daughter's just finished at Bailey and she's going to Harvard. They're very certain that that's required and so it gets done. But others who've never done well out of education see no way up for their children except sheer luck. Market researcher Deborah Mattinson. When we asked them how they could fulfil their dreams, they talked about winning the lottery. They talked about going on a reality TV show. 
and they were much less likely to see education as a route through. They would not expect university and they bemoaned the fact that kind of vocational training like high quality apprenticeships they felt were not available to them anymore. But why don't they aspire? The sociologist John Goldthorpe says that for many working class teenagers the risk of going to university seems too high. But Lee Elliott Major from the Sutton Trust has surveyed state school teachers and thinks they sometimes expect too little. We found that for about half of state school teachers that they said that they would not advise their brighter children to consider applying to Oxbridge. Do you think teachers failing to encourage children to apply for Oxbridge explains why so few do and why so few get in? I think part of it is down to not knowing what Oxbridge is about and part of it is the sort of not for the likes of us sort of attitude and it really depresses me because I know in those schools there are children bright enough to flourish once they go into these institutions. People say whose uh, GCSE results suggest they probably could make it uh, trying to get to university but it's not absolutely sure. It's with these people that class differences kick in. Children from less advantaged backgrounds are, I think, quite rationally, more risk averse. And I think will become increasingly so when they're faced with the prospect of uh, £30,000 or more of debt. The state has tried to force universities to get more working class students through the door, and many are trying hard to meet their targets. But the middle classes do take pains to congregate in the best schools. The top 20 state schools have only 3% of pupils on free school meals, compared with a national average of 14%. Many so-called comprehensives are nothing of the sort in their class intake. Perhaps that's why the Sutton Trust found the bottom 2,000 comprehensives send fewer pupils to Oxbridge than the nation's top five schools, four of which are private. But here's a school that's found ways to boost their pupils' chances. Cockermouth School in Cumbria doesn't have an exceptional intake and it gets A-level results below the national average, yet it gets a surprisingly high proportion of its pupils into the top 30 universities. So what's the secret? Jeff Walker is the head teacher. We have a, a programme um, aiming for uh, their future careers from literally the moment they arrive. The first expectation we say to all our students is that they are likely to be here for seven years and therefore for most of them that would mean sixth form and progression often into higher education. And secondly, past students and ex-university students come out to talk to children, particularly from non-university backgrounds, about aiming high. One non-graduate parent, Shirley Barnes, attended the school herself when it was a secondary modern and left at 16 to work in the local shoe factory. But her children's experience at Cockermouth School was rather different. I've always encouraged them, I've always said education's important and I think if you try your best at anything you do and enjoy it, that's all a parent can ask for. I knew I didn't go to university, my husband didn't go to university, so in fact it's the first in our family to go to university, my son and my daughter. My son did foundation year at Loughborough University for engineering and my daughter went to Birmingham University and has done um, an English degree and she has come out with a BA English with creative writing with honours, class one. I did ask my daughter about Oxbridge. Um, she said she'd been asked if she wanted to go. She went to visit Oxford, but when she came back, she just said, I don't think it's my kind of university, ma'am. How exactly does the school marshal the chaos of teenage dreams to fit the dizzying array of university courses, apprenticeships and application requirements? The actual practical process starts in about February of year 12, where we will invite the University of Newcastle to come in. We're a partner school with them and they will talk to the students about why you should go to university. And about Alongside her colleagues, the head of sixth form, Charlotte Dumble, has devised a highly orchestrated early guidance system for every pupil, whether heading for Oxbridge or for an apprenticeship. It's a test that's a simple test that's on the website which will help them identify strengths, weaknesses and possible areas for them to investigate. All our tutors work with their tutees to mentor them, to help them to come to these decisions and then at the end of year 12, each student receives an individual guidance session Part of this is about getting pupils like Kirsty to express their enthusiasm. I had no real preference before getting into really GCSEs because none of my family have gone to university. But as soon as I finalise my own career choice, I want to be a midwife. I kind of I have to go to university now. 
Now, convince me now, why you, why do you want to be a midwife and how are you going to put that into your personal statement? What are you going to tell me about? I pretty much said that I want to be able to sort of offer a continued care for women and their families because it's something I'm interested in and I want to be able to do a job that I think is worthwhile. Right. And tell me from your work experience, is there one thing that stands out as being something that's really inspired you that you could perhaps draw on? In the yeah, um, I've said that I'd, if I had got the opportunity and I got on a course, I'd really like to specialise as a breastfeeding consultant because we did um, a day with a woman who was just completely run down and just by speaking to a midwife about it, it really helped her. Wonderful. And I think that sort of thing, if you can get, obviously you've not got that many words, but if you can get some flavour of that into your personal statement, mm -hmm. I think you'll, it, will, it, will, it will be something that will be really beneficial to your application. Teachers can and do buck the statistical odds and help bright pupils who might never have thought of even applying to the top universities to get through the psychological barriers that reinforce the class ceiling. Sean from Cockermouth has no graduates in his family. Shirley from B6 College back in Hackney dropped out of education at 18 with no qualifications and no intention of going to university. But Sean is now on his way to Oxford, Shirley to Birmingham. My um, mum has always been one to push me academically and a friend of mine suggested that uh, I should do A-levels just to sort of get me back on track and give me some sort of purpose. There were quite a few times I couldn't come into college because the money wasn't there. I was having to spend like £15 every week just to be able to get into college. My parents often hinted at it that there might be potential there to apply to university and it did seem almost quite alien to start with to think about going away somewhere on your own at the age of 18. When I first decided that I wanted to study physics, there was uh, teachers definitely encouraging me to apply to the top places, if you want to use that word. I found out about a scheme, the Pembroke programme that they run here at B6. It's basically a year-long series of lectures which culminates in a week-long summer programme. We stayed at Pembroke College, Oxford. And it was made as clear to me as it possibly could have been about what it meant to apply to these places, to sit aptitude tests, to be interviewed. And something that the school and the staff cleared up for me the most was what they're looking for. The whole time the emphasis was on they're not looking to see if you're a genius. They're looking to see how you think. So, so that idea seemed bizarre to me at first. The more we went to the lectures, the more I began to sort of believe that I could, you know, apply, go to university, have a good time there. Have you surprised yourself? Yes, yeah. I was pleased with how I did, but I wasn't sure if I'd done well enough in the interviews to deserve that place. I slid the letter out very slowly to see we proposed to make you an offer. So once you've got to university, is that it? You've arrived, now you're middle class, right? That's not always so easy. There was a, a few people in front of me, just oh, the foshest voices I'd ever heard. Felt very out of place. I do remember embarrassing social scrapes, like not knowing what an avocado pear was. I've spoken about having gone through my life fearing a, a tap on the shoulder, you know, at university, someone saying, oh, you, you've slipped through the net, this place isn't for the likes of you. Now walking through the centre of Cambridge and seeing dozens of people in gowns doesn't, you know, take you back at all, it's just a normal sight and that's quite weird, but that has become normal. The journey that I took distanced me from my family, actually. I have had times in my life where I have struggled to explain to my mother or father what I do for a living. They're proud, but they're also slightly regretful that I and my brother both went to university and then moved away and never came back. So I, I think social mobility is not easy on an individual level. No one knows yet whether people thinking of trying to cross that bridge may in future be deterred by the prospect of £27,000 university fees. So a child's journey from birth to adulthood presents all kinds of chances and obstacles. But there are limits to what education can do. Politicians are eager to see the problem of class solved in the classroom. But there's a deeper question, the widening gap in how much people are paid. As Universities Minister David Willits writes in his book The Pinch, 
Western societies with less mobility are the ones with less equality too. Richard Wilkinson, author of The Spirit Level. There's no way we can avoid uh, facing the issue of the material income differences themselves. We all want a classless society. Endless people pay lip service to that. We dislike signs of prejudice and snobbery and so on. And yet it looks to me as if to try and create a classless society without reducing the income differences between people is like trying to slim without worrying about the calories. However, some champions of social mobility will never find the idea of greater equality desirable. David Davis. If you've got a very small gap between top and bottom, then more people almost almost by random walk movement are going to make it up and down that. That's, that's a simple truth. Isn't that a good thing? Uh, no, not necessarily. And secondly, of course, when you say a very high and steep ladder, it means the rewards for huge success are huge, you know. And the rewards, bear in mind, in a decently run capitalist society, are not just for the individual who makes the success. Let's not forget, we are still about the fifth biggest economy in the world. We're incredibly wealthy in this country. We've done pretty well, actually. What we're arguing about is, if you like, allowing more people to take part in that race, which develops the wealth, rather than have it confined to too small a group, the same small group, over the course of a whole century or two. So if you've made it through education, your qualifications will be your passport upwards. But what if you haven't? Can you still cross the great class divide? In our next programme, we'll trace what happens when you look for a job and a home and ask whether it's all that which really cements the class ceiling over people's heads. The Class Ceiling was presented by Polly Toynbee and produced by Phil Tinline.